Okay, today we're going to have the um, other two candidates, um, Andrea Lisenby and Adam Burks. Um, and I'm glad to see that we have reporters here. Um, we will start out with each of them giving a five minute presentation of whatever they want. They can introduce themselves, say why they're running, they can do whatever they want to say for five minutes. Um, and then 30 seconds before your five minutes is up, I hold up this. Then 10 seconds before your time is up, I hold up this. And when your time is up, I hold up this. And um, then after that, we can have questions. Uh, I ask that you try and restrict your questioning to 30 seconds because we want to listen to our candidates and not to us. Um, incidentally, question, the reporters from the media are free to ask questions too. Uh, we'd love to have those uh, asked. Um, and what I'll do, and, and then after we get close to the end, I'll stop that. We'll have another five minute presentation from each one so they can wind up any loose ends that they feel they need to wind up, um, five minutes each. And I will alternate who start, who answers a question first, hopefully. If I mess up, you let me know, uh, because that's easy for me to do. Um, and I think I'll start out with, um, alphabetically, Adam Burks comes first. So Adam, uh, let's see, where are you on there? I'm trying to locate people. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Adam, you have five minutes. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you guys for hosting this for us today to get to introduce ourselves and kind of tell you a little bit about um, who I am and what I think I could do for our community. Like you said, my name is Adam Burks, and I currently live here in Columbia. I've been a Columbia resident my entire life. I'm actually from Harrisburg, Missouri, which is just a small town north of Columbia. Um, my wife and I, Melody, we have four kids. They all attend Columbia Public Schools, and they have attended Columbia Public Schools ever since they've been in school. Currently, I have two at Parkgate Elementary, and I have two at West Middle. Um, I have attended all the local colleges in Columbia, so I have received my bachelor's degree from Columbia College, and then I received my master's in business administration from William Woods University here at the Columbia campus. I am an active member of my community and I have a passion to serve for my community. I am an active member of the Boone County Fire Protection District. I've been with that organization for a little over tw almost 20 years this year. And I currently serve as a captain and station manager and I'm responsible for the fire station 13, which is located north of Columbia, just north of Twin Bridges. So it's actually between Columbia and Harrisburg on Rowdy. We have a small team of uh, members that are part of that station, but I'm ultimately responsible um, for one engine company and a grass rig company. So we run two fire trucks out of that station. We have a roster of about seven volunteers that are assigned to that station and we respond to calls of service. Um, it's a very nice station. We respond to about five to seven calls a, a month out of that station, which is great for me uh, because I'm getting a little bit older and I'm not, um, I don't do well with running calls multiple times throughout the evening like I used to uh, 20 years ago. I currently work for Midway USA here in Columbia, Missouri as the safety and facilities manager. My roles and responsibilities here at this organization is I'm responsible for our three campus locations from a facility and safety management perspective. So from that, I'm responsible for building maintenance and upkeep. I run a janitorial staff that maintains our facilities. And then I'm also responsible for all safety programs, including our COVID-19 response and mitigation plan. Why I'm running, I am uh, running because I'm a concerned parent. For the last couple of years, I've been really considering running for Columbia School Board, and I'm at a position in my career where I think that I can offer some really valuable insight, not only from a volunteer standpoint, but also from a business standpoint of how we could make um, our public school systems um, be a little bit more efficient with our money that we receive, um, being a little bit more uh, efficient with our leadership structures, making sure that we're providing the right tools and support, not only to answer our calls from our community, but to give those tools and resources to our superintendent so that he could do his job appropriately and make sure that our educators have the tools and resources that they need. I have a couple plans. My first plan is that we're gonna put students first always. If we don't put our students first always, 
we are not meeting the primary objective of the Columbia Public School System. The Columbia Public School System does not exist to own property, build structures, develop programs, or even employ staff, but we exist to simply deliver the highest quality education possible for every single student that, works through, that walks through that door, regardless of their status. We have quality teachers and we need to make sure that they understand that they're quality, dedicated, amazing staff. We need to empower them to run their classrooms and prioritize academics over administrative bureaucracy. We need to ensure that CPS um, offers the financial and instructional resources to help recruit, train, and maintain the highest quality teachers that we could find in the US. And finally, parents make the difference. Without the support of our parents in our community, CPS will not be successful. As a concerned parent in this, in this community, I am really afraid that we have lost some community support. We have two major factors coming up in this April election. The first is our no tax crease bond issue. We have lost some community support that the school board has the proper direction and management and leadership to take us into the future. And those are bridges that we need to repair very quickly. We also need to make sure um, that as part of the school board, that we're making sure that we have a financial long range plan of how we're gonna support maintaining and recruiting those high performing educators. Again, I really wanna thank you all for having me today. And I really look forward to the questions that you're going to give us today. Thank you. Okay, well, you fine, thank you. All right, Ms. Lisenby, you are next. Hi, Neil Skinners. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name's Andrea Lisenby, and I'm excited for the opportunity to play a larger role in our school district. I will work hard to set all of our children up for a bright and successful future. My husband, Kyle, and I moved to Columbia 14 years ago and just fell in love with the Columbia community. I'm a mother of three with kids in elementary and middle school. Our oldest is at Gentry Middle School, and she's a sixth grader. She's fortunate enough to be in the Triple E program and taking some, an honors math class. We have a fourth grader who is at Beulah Ralph Elementary and she is in what is called a district classroom. And that means um, it's a special education classroom for kids in grades K through five. And she's got about eight peers in her classroom with her and she is on an IEP and um, does absolutely love school and is doing really well. And then our youngest is a kindergartner and he is learning to read and doing, doing all the boy activities that, that our girls don't do. So they keep us on our toes and we, we love our children. Uh, I serve on several PTAs and I volunteer in the schools absolutely as much as I possibly can. I have two decades of career experience in the business world, including being a business owner. And I look forward to bringing all those experiences to the position of the Columbia School Board. The slogan that I came up with for my campaign is listen, learn, lead. This embodies who I am as a person and what I plan to do if elected to the school board. Let me explain. The first, listen, I will listen to our CPS parents to ensure that their concerns are being heard and their children's needs are being met. I will listen to our CPS teachers to ensure we are giving them the tools and resources that they need to deliver a quality education to every student. Number two, learn. We must learn from the successes and the failures of our CPS pandemic policies and ensure that every decision going forward is made in the best interest of every CPS student. And finally, number three, I will lead. I pledge to improve the communication between our community and the school district. The school board should be facilitating the conversation and instilling confidence in our CPS experience. I'm running for Columbia School Board now because more than ever, our district is in need of strong leaders who will ask the tough questions, make difficult decisions, and are willing to be held accountable for all of it. Our district needs to take action action to address employee turnover and declining math and iReady test scores. I believe our CPS community is struggling. And unless we take swift action to chart a new path, we will be setting our children up for even greater adversity. As a new school board member, I will work to listen, learn, and lead our CPS community through our current challenges and into a successful future for every CPS student educator and family member. I believe in our public education system 
and I will work very hard to make sure ours here in Columbia is the best that it absolutely can be. Thanks again. Thank you. Now we will open it up for questions and I, I don't know if I mentioned each of you has two minutes to answer each question. Sometimes that's not enough and that's where the last five minutes are going to come into play. You can you can hang a tie up loose ends that way. Um, but uh, Leslie, anyway, I started uh, with Mr. Burks first. So Ms. Lizenby will answer the first question. And what is the first question? Uh, I, I have a, a procedural suggestion okay. uh, that Kathy mentioned to me, or I think she kind of helps keep an eye open for questions. But if we would to raise your hand so it's waving, because that doesn't, she may not see you there. If you go down to the bottom right hand corner where it says reactions, and click on raise hand, it automatically brings you to the front of the gallery and makes it easier for her to see that. So if you have a question, please do it that way and it'll make it easier for you to be grabbed. Yeah, so is it Kathy will be calling on the people? Yes. Where are you? Oh, there. Or at least help you, at least help you find them. <laughs> oh, there she is, okay. All right, are there any questions? Kathy will recognize folks. Uh, David Robinson had his hand up. Okay, yes. Mr. Robinson. I, I, I love both of your uh, opening statements to see uh, pretty young parents uh, so involved and willing to serve is, um, and, and the things that you said are things that we all have to agree with. So I'm gonna push you for some specifics and uh, see if you can keep us all agreeing with you. What are the uh, one or two most important things that you want to retain about the um, about the character of Columbia School District and uh, Columbia Public Schools, and what are one or two things that you think think uh, should be changed? Okay, Ms. Lizenby. Okay, I love this question. I've never been asked um, what we want to retain, so that's a fun one. And can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, one of my favorite things about Columbia Public Schools is all the opportunities that we provide for our high school students. I think the partnership that we have with the Career Center is absolutely amazing, and it allows our students to pursue more specific career paths. Maybe they have a technical interest or they just want to learn something that is beyond what's offered at the high school. And so I think that partnership is amazing. I'm really excited that the bond is going to address the potential for um, expanding our career center. I think that bringing it up into the 21st century will be just such a wonderful opportunity for our students to learn even more. So I'm excited about that. Uh, the other thing I think we're doing well is we have outstanding educators in Columbia. They work hard, they pursue through a lot. Our family, you know, personally, we are have very close relationships with my daughter's special education teachers. And, you know, I would take a bullet for every single one of them. They work very hard in what I know is a difficult classroom setting. And so I'm very grateful for all of our teachers. There are a couple things that I think we could improve upon. Uh, there's room for growth within our academics in the range of K through 12. We've all been hearing about the test scores that are declining. Columbia currently ranks ninth out of 13 amongst our comparison districts. And that's not where we used to be years ago. And I'm excited for the opportunity to help bring Columbia back up to where it used to be. We used to be a leader in the state and I think that we can get there again. And I think I'm almost out of time, so I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, fine. Okay, um, Mr. Burks. Yes, thanks, Leslie. That's a really good question, David, and I really like it. Thank you for asking that. Um, the first thing I'm going to agree with Andrea is, is our career center. I don't know if people truly understand the value of that institution and the capabilities that we have to expand that program to really engage our citizens here within our community, not only from students that attend CPS, but I have, a, as an adult, have actually taken some classes at the Career Center just to kind of help me professionally in some, in some areas that I'm not very familiar with. So we're not even looking at it from it's, it's benefiting our students, but it's actually benefiting our community. Um, we are coming to an age where we are running out of some skilled labor 
um, workers in our in our U.S. or in our workforce. And so that facility has a true opportunity to ensure that there is a path for every student that walks through CPS. Um, the other thing are the honors programs that we offer here at CPS. I want to see those expanded. Um, I just enrolled one of my oldest sons in the AVID program. Uh, sorry, we applied. He qualified and we applied. And he's super, super excited about this opportunity. Um, so we have great programs and we're making them even better. I just want to make sure that we don't lose focus with these extracurricular programs, making sure that we're also focusing on the fundamentals to ensure that we could get people to those extra programs. Some of the things I think we could improve upon, um, first and foremost, is communication. Communication is the foundation piece of CPS. And we need to make sure that we get our community engagement back and that we're communicating. And not only when I talk about communicating, it's not that we're listening, but are we listening and we're giving feedback to our community. And so I wanna come in if elected into this position. And one of my primary goals is I wanna revamp the entire communication program for CPS. I wanna be able to create a program that ought, we gain feedback, but that we give feedback back to our community to let us know where we are in all those steps and what we can and can't do. And I, I got the stop sign. Well, you might guess. <laughs> My clock says stop. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> Is there another question? <laughs> uh, Carl and Mari. All right. Hi, Carl. Um, I'm, I'll ask the first one. Carl has another question for later, but um, I am in agreement that parents need to be active partners in their children's education and that parental voices are important. However, my observation of public discourse of late has been that um, the loudest voices are not necessarily representative of the majority of parents. And so my question is how, what you both talked about uh, listening to parents, how would you go about that in a way that you actually get a picture of what most parents want and um, how would that be different from the current system? Whereas I understand that people are allowed to come to the school board meetings and speak for a certain amount of time about whatever they wanna talk about. Okay, well, we can start with Mr. Burks. Thanks, Leslie. It goes back to what one of my opportunity for improvements that I wanna do is talking and looking at that communication process. I think we are to a point now where people are very angry where they feel like they're not being heard because showing up to a school board meeting is a one-way communication path. There's no two-way communication. So there's a lot of frustration built up there. And so I'm looking at how do we prevent that from happening? We need to fix the issues upstream. And if we could, when we listen to people, sometimes they just wanna be heard and we need to follow up with facts. So I'm a fact-based decision maker. So I'm going, to talk, I'm going to have that communication path with them, but then I'm gonna follow up and be like, I understand where you're coming from, but there's a lot of feelings in there. Where's the facts? What can we do to improve it? What suggestions do you have? And then my job as a school board member is to bring that information back to the school board and we need to discuss it as a group to figure out what is the proper direction. Does this align with the mission and vision and values of Columbia Public School District? And do we need to move forward with it? If we do, then we follow up with that person and let them know. If we don't, we follow up with that person and say, hey, we understand your concerns. Here's what we found. Here are the facts. And this is where we're going to go with it. But we need to make sure that we close that loop. And that's the piece that I see that we're missing is we're not doing that follow-up piece. And I think that's what's frustrating with people. They don't feel like there's any action being taken, but there might be behind the scenes. We're just not knowing about it. Is that it? Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, Ms. Lisenby? Uh, you're on mute, Ms. Lisenby. You're on mute. We can't hear you. How about, okay. 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 <laughs> Um, you're correct. At our school board meetings, there are three minutes allowed for each person to use that time for public comment. And it, it's what our system allows for currently. That's, that's the method that exists. And so people use it however they choose to. And, and that's um, oftentimes is not always effective communication, as, as we all know, right? 
So my proposed solution is to implement parent advisory committees. And I've looked into this at length and it's being done at school boards all across our country. And a parent advisory committee allows collaboration among parents and community members and students to collect feedback and deliver it to the school board and to the administration in a very usable format. It's a way of consolidating uh, voices, whether they're uh, groups that agree or disagree, or maybe it's a little bit of both, and then providing that information to the school board, again, as I said, in a useful format so that they can take action based on um, a consensus of feedback one way or another. These can go wrong if they're not done correctly. I'm fully aware of that. And I think our current um, school board and administration has been hesitant on parent advisory committees. But I do think that we're at a point now where we need to try something new because you know, they can't make effective decisions if they're not hearing what the community input is. And getting, getting input one person at a time, you know, either sending an email or voicing their three minutes doesn't allow for effective communication. That's it, okay. Um, well, I think Carl had a question. Yeah, we're taking advantage of this family family <laughs> thing. Uh, and, and as, as you might imagine, uh, I, my, my spouse and I have, have some similar uh, ideas with respect to uh, to the to communications seconds. and so on. I'm more interested at this point, a little bit different take on meeting decorum. We have some challenges, city council, so does the school board. Um, any thoughts or comments on how to deal with, uh, with meeting decorum in terms of uh, the folks that present? And then one other aspect of the question has to do with the relationship between the Columbia School, school System and the, and the city. Historically, we, we had a little bit more communications with, uh, with some of the folks. These days we have a quarterly meeting, but most of it is really just an information session. Any ideas about how we might improve communication between the city and the school board who has some uh, similar vested interests? Okay, hey, this time we start with Ms. Lissenby. Okay, um, remind me what your first question was. It was in regards to... It has to do with, with, with uh, meeting decorum. Oh, meeting particular. decorum, you absolutely. This, but, but, but there is some coarseness in the political discourse these days. And how, how do you see that we might improve that kind of thing, both in terms of your position and, and frankly, and, and in mine? Um, I, I'm guessing that you're referring to the three minutes allotted at school board meetings for public comment. And I think, you know, our First Amendment allows for freedom of speech and adults should conduct themselves with decorum. I'm not sure that it would be legal to put too many parameters on what and how things are allowed to be said. Um, I think that I would prefer to look into that those specific requirements a little more specifically before answering that question entirely. Um, as far as communication between the school system and the city goes, I think I've seen a little bit of a decline in our school system at CPS, building relationships and maintaining healthy relationships with other partners in our community. Um, I agree, I, I would like to see this, uh, you know, our school district interacting with our city more, building those relationships stronger. I would also like to see our school district working hand in hand with legislators as opposed to opposing them. I would like to see, most importantly, very passionate about our, our school system working in partnership with mental health resources. I've been meeting with a uh, president over at Burl Health and working on plans for how Burl Health can come into Columbia Public Schools and help facilitate needing the mental health support for our students. They're estimating that 3,000 to 3,500 CPS students are in need of mental health services. And I would love to be a school board member who can come in and build those relationships with our other partners in the district to benefit our, our students and our schools. Okay, thank you, you just made it. Um, all right, Mr. Burks. Okay, Carl, so for the first part of your question, I think 
from my understanding, you're talking about the behaviors of the people that are presenting there at the school board. And I, and I think this goes back to our communication structure. Um, we, I think we are to a point in our community where people are very frustrated. And you can see that in some behaviors. Um, if we look at the root cause of what's causing this, and if you listen to what their messages are, they feel like they're not being heard or that they're being listened to. And I go back to the first thing that I was talking about earlier, we have to fix the communication piece up front. And if we don't have a good communication foundation for our organization, we will continue to see this downward trend where people are not working together, we're working against each other. And we can't survive as a school district doing that. So we've got to fix that piece. We have to be open. We have to be transparent. We have to truly live to the values that are posted on that Columbia Public School poster outside each entrance that talk about the values of the organization. Transparency and two-way communication are part of that. In relationship building, as being a member of the Boone County Fire Protection District, I can't express to anybody that lives in Boone County of truly how great we have it. Living and working in communities around us, people have no idea of the amazing resources we have sitting in our backyard that we don't touch. And what I wanna do is with my public safety partner relationships, even like with behavioral health or Bureau of Behavioral Health, they've reached out to me as well. These are free resources that we could use as a community that have great partnership capabilities. And that's what we need to work on. We need to build on building partnerships and relationships to make CPS the best institution in the state of Missouri, which is one of our visions and missions. Okay. Kathy? Um, I don't see any hands up. So let me ask a question. Um, what is your each of your position on uh, the school bond question that is be, will be on the ballot in April? Mr. Burks. Absolutely. I'm 100% for the school bond and for a couple reasons. As a safety and facilities manager, I know what it takes to build buildings and structures. It's part of my job. And if we don't get this bond issue passed, we're gonna be really far behind the ball. This bond issue is the first portion of the 80 million. It's gonna be in a 40 million, 40 million allotment. It's gonna be the first issued bonds is going to address the major building repairs that we need to make to the career center. If we don't make these repairs to the career center, it could be detrimental to that program. There are some serious building issues that have to be addressed. The second part of that bond issue is for a new elementary school. I could tell you because we're getting ready to work on our newest facility that we're getting ready to build. We tried to order steel a couple of weeks ago and they're telling us it's anywhere from a year to a year and a half before we'll even see it. If we are not building buildings now and having a long range facility plan, by the time we need it, we're gonna be about four to six years behind the ball. And we can't do that. We can't, we can't fail our students. We have to put our students first always. So we have to make sure that we get people to understand of how important it is for that bond issue to be passed for our students. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Lissenby. I'm 100% in favor of the bond. As you know, I said earlier, and as Mr. Burks just mentioned, the Career Center is very important. I think it's part of the way of the future for education. And as I said, I'm super excited to have that as an opportunity for all of our high school students to take advantage of. Of course, we need more elementary schools. Columbia, we're very fortunate in that it just continues to grow. And I, I believe strongly that we need to keep our public education system strong and we will continue to fill these buildings and we will continue to need more bonds. We will continue for, to have a need for tax levies as well. And what I'm also very mindful of is continuing to build community trust in our public school system. Without the trust of our community, we are not gonna be able to have bonds and tax levies passed. And that goes back to communication as we were talking about prior, making sure that the community understands why the decisions are being made and how they're being made, communicating it to them to instill trust and confidence in the school board and our leadership and our district. Okay, thank you. David Mallory has his hand up and then Alice Turner. 
Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, oh, yeah, I said we're done with the easy questions. Now I got a tough one. <laughs> I, everyone gets two votes for school board. I expect each one of you is going to vote for yourself. Would you share with us who do you plan to cast your other vote for and why? I, I like this question. I heard you guys ask it at the at the meeting last week, so <laughs> um, I, th I thought it might be coming. Uh, yes, I would. I will vote for myself. I know that I am far and away the most passionate person of the four of us who is so invested in our students. And the other person I would cast my vote for would most certainly be Mr. Burks. I strongly admire. He's got two decades of experience working in finance and strategic planning. And those are areas where our school board leadership could use um, some more perspective. And I, that's quite a strength that um, he brings to the school board. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Burks. Thank you. Uh, David, I, I thought long and hard about this as well. Um, it's a tough decision, um, but I think when you look at the facts, and we look at performance that I'm a fact-based decision maker. Um, I have a very strong business mindset, you know, to be successful and how do we carry forward. And I have had the opportunity to um, listen to all the candidates and, and talk with some of them about who I think would best interest and in carry the district forward in meeting our mission and values of, of CPS. And I would have to say, first of all, I'm gonna vote for myself because I, I feel confident and passionate that I could serve in that role. And then my other one is going to be Andrea. And the reason why I'm picking Andrea is when I, when I look at the track record, um, I never want to talk negatively about another school board candidate because they're doing this job for free. But when I look at the performance of somebody, I'm looking at, are they meeting their goals and objectives of the mission and vision and values of CPS? And I don't feel like Blake has done that. I don't feel like Blake is taking our district to where it needs to go in the future. Um, and, and there's a couple reasons why decisions aren't being made in my way of students first always. Um, Suzette, I believe that she's made some comments that make me believe that she has a lot of those mindsets of it's, it's putting the teachers first. And when we put teachers first, our students are going to fail. It's a business mindset. If you put your customers first, everything else follows in line. It's standard business management practices. And so when I talk with Andrea, her being passionate about students and also maintaining those high quality student or those high quality educators, I believe we have a lot of the same like-minded decisions and that's why I would vote for her. Okay, thank you. Alice. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so uh, my question has um, to do with a prior conversation I'd had with Andrea um, when I met her. Um, Andrea, I just want to say I have two teaching degrees and I raised a child in the Columbia Public Schools system and he's doing fabulous and he had a great education, an absolutely great education. And, um, but you had made some comments to me that you believe the Columbia Public School system has dropped in its academic standing. And this was new information to me. Um, I just briefly looked it up there are 460 school districts in Missouri, and we're in the top 30. Um, and uh, that's looking at many different factors along with academics. But um, so, and I, and I am familiar with some of the amazing opportunities. <laughs> You've taken up your time. Okay. Wait, do you have a question? So my question is, perhaps you could explain why you're concerned with academics in addition to having gone through COVID. Thank you. All right, and so the first one is Mr. Burks. Thank you. That's a good question, Alice. And I can tell you as a parent that have children in elementary and middle school, we are struggling. We're struggling to meet the basic requirements of education uh, requirements. I have a second grader um, that has not really been in the classroom for a year and a half. And there was no programs or no guidance or no plan to catch these kids up on reading. It's a tremendous issue. And yet today, we still don't have a plan. My second grader was reading at a kindergarten level when she entered second grade this spring or this fall. And she is still struggling. And we're seeing this across the second grade. I'm seeing the same issues in the middle school portion. There is a, huge, a large disconnect from elementary to middle school. 
and getting those students ready for the middle school mentality. It's a big change in life. And there's no programs that get our students ready for that big shock factor, especially again, when we made that transition through a distance or education learning. When I'm looking at what my, my children are learning in CPS, we're still forgetting the fundamentals. We're worried about some big flashy things and that has distracted us from getting back to the core pieces. And that's really shown in iReady and te MAP testing scores. I know it's one piece of the puzzle, but when you look at it, it is all a downward trend. So when you have a downward trend, you know that something is broken. So if I have a downward trend in my checking account every month, I know something's wrong. I need to take it back and look at it. And that's a piece that we haven't done yet. All right, All right Ms. Lizenby. Alice, I appreciate your question. <laughs> um, I think that perhaps you um, have seen the video that's been going around and it's showing that ever since 2015, 2016, our performance in MAP scores has declined consistently. Our, we are now considered ninth out of 13 comparable school districts. And these are 13 school districts that Columbia has identified as what they call comparison. So similar size, similar uh, student population, socioeconomics, et cetera. And this is all available on Columbia Public School website. On the homepage, you can get to all this information. Similarly, our iReady test scores are decreasing. And so, you know, when people talk about, oh, students aren't motivated to do well on test scores because they don't get graded on it. But every year, they're not motivated to do well. And so we really are comparing apples to apples when we are looking at our own declination and progress over the years. Also, Columbia students are no less motivated than students in St. Louis or Jeff City or any of our other comparable districts. And so again, I, I do believe it's apples to apples when we're comparing ourselves against other school districts. Now, test scores are test scores. That's just one of the many things that we wanna look at to determine our success. The reason that we bring that up is because our school administration and school board has determined that the test scores are how we are going to evaluate our progress and our success as a district. I believe that there's many other things we need to consider and I would, I, I would love to implement other measures to determine our success. And you know, to be more specific, I have met with Dr. Yearwood a couple of times in the past few weeks and we are in talks about, and I'm fully supportive of him, um, finding other assessments for our students that we can do on a on a six week basis. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Carl and Mari. Yeah, um, I have another question. First of all, I have a comment. I would caution anyone who looks at the statistics that were just cited to read the footnotes because the map chest changed completely in 2017 and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education indicates that in the footnotes that numbers before that are not to be compared to the newer numbers. Same with 2021, because of the exigencies of COVID, the testing was off and it's clearly labeled, do not compare these numbers to past numbers. So just- Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Information. Um, but my question is, I volunteer at Alpha Heart Lewis Elementary School on Friday afternoons. I scoot out of here and go to the library there to volunteer. And it's my observation, first of all, that children definitely are in their seats and learning um, and, and how hard the teachers work. But there is a quite a mismatch between um, the economic status and racial makeup of the student body compared with the teachers and administration there. And um, I'm wondering how each of you responds to the need for um, equity training for teachers and administrators so that they are relating appropriately to children from a different socioeconomic class. And also how, if you were to establish parent advisory councils, how you would assure that those actually represent parents of, of public school children and not just middle-class educated 
vocal. Okay. Stay at why home. Don't we, why don't we have okay. them answer the question now? Um, Ms. Lizenby, you were the first, you're, you're next, aren't you? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for volunteering. We, our schools desperately need volunteers and I, I myself go into volunteer and I'm thankful that you do that also. And likewise, uh, while we're thanking people, thanking our teachers, especially the ones who are at the, the schools that are more difficult to teach in. You know, I'm out in the community talking to dozens and dozens of teachers every month, and they're telling us some schools are harder to teach in. And so we're especially thankful for the ones who teach in uh, what they have told us is uh, more difficult schools. Um, when I've spoken with teachers of color, I assume that's kind of where you're headed with this, they like to be in what they call affinity groups. And so they would like, we need to be as a school district mindful of placing our teachers of color in affinity groups so that they can feel supported. And if we can align those affinity groups with the school student population, I think that serves everyone's best interest. I also think that we need to provide a more, um, engaging mentorship program for our teachers of color. We need to support them in their first year or two that they're teaching. And if they're new teachers, we also need to support them in their first year or two of teaching here in Columbia. We do have quite a bit of diversity and the more that we can have a, a mentor of color mentoring a teacher of color, the stronger that um, everybody is going to be and the more robust our educational system will be. When you ask about parent advisory committees, I'm very excited to hear you say this, and I'm not 100% sure. I do wanna look into this further to find out ways that we can make sure that everyone is represented. We need to most certainly make it accessible. We can't expect necessarily um, all of the parents and all of the community members to be able to get to the same places at the same times as others. and so. We need to look very carefully into how those are set up. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Burks. So going back to um, the first part of your question was about um, teachers. My platform is that we're gonna put students first always. And so what do we need to do to take care of each student that walks through that door? Every student that walks through any CPS door has the same opportunities or should be given the same opportunities and the same capabilities of anybody, regardless of, of color, race, age. I, I don't like labeling kids because when we start labeling kids, we start going down paths where we make assumptions. So if we put our students first and we put the educators where they're going to be best fit based off their educational experience and their strengths, that's how we succeed as an organization. Um, like I said, I... My kids go to a Parkgate Elementary School, which is a primary free and reduced lunch. And when I walk into that facility, there is assumptions that are made that these kids are not gonna be great people when they grow up. Every single person that walks through that door has a capability to be anybody they wanna be. It is our educators' jobs, it is the school board's jobs to find that in each and every child that walks through that door and help them succeed. And so I, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit about when we labeling kids, because as a parent and going into that school, and when I volunteer with my fire gear, which is like one of my most favorite things to do, we have fire day, and I spend the whole afternoon with them. It changes the kids' lives, and that's my job. How can I impact their lives be to be the best person they can be? And I'm sorry, I didn't get to the last part of your question because I got the stop sign. Well, thank you. I see we have about 14, it's one after the hour. So we have 14 minutes left. Do you think we have time for one more question and then the wrap up? Okay, well, if there's one more question, Kathy, you can call. I don't. I don't, I don't see any hands. No. Oh, all right. Well, then you each have five minutes and um, I guess we'll go first with Miss Lizenby. Uh, yeah, unmute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Mule Skinner, thank you so much for hosting us. Um, I've really enjoyed my time here with you. And fortunately, my husband and son have stayed downstairs as not to be 
uh, running around <laughs> in the background. Uh, you all have been very gracious and most certainly have given us very fair and important questions. And we really appreciate people of the community taking an interest in the school board. You know, in talking with some parents, they've thrown their hands up or they've given up and um, that's discouraging. And so I'm, I, again, I'm just thank you so much for taking an interest in our, our school system, our school board candidates and, and our students most importantly. I believe it's important to have school board members who believe in a strong and vibrant public educational system. I do, and that's why I'm running for Columbia School Board. Our educational system was harmed by the pandemic and we have some ground to make up. I believe we need to focus first on English, math, science, and social studies. Columbia Public Schools vision statement is this, to be the best school district in the state. We need strong, accountable leaders at the helm. It's the school board's responsibility to support educators and listen to parents in the community. It's our duty to ensure our kids are prepared for life after high school. Earlier this week, a friend of mine told me a quote, and it goes like this. What is educationally desirable should be made administratively possible. I'll repeat it again. What is educationally desirable should be made administratively possible. Does anyone know who said that? It was Dr. Neil Aslan, the gentleman after whom the Aslan administration building was named. My friend told me that this quote used to be etched into the side of our administration building, but it has since been removed. And I like his quote and I'm not willing to give up on it yet. I look forward to the possibility of being able to serve my community by working really hard for our students and our school district as a member of the Columbia School Board. I'm eager for the opportunity to play a larger role in our school district, and I will work very hard to set all of the children up for bright and successful futures. And thank you again, and I would greatly appreciate if you would consider voting for me on April 5th. Okay, Mr. Burks. <laughs> Again, just like Andrea said, I just wanna echo, I really appreciate you all taking time out of your lunch hour today to speak with us. And, and you guys have had some really great questions and I really appreciate that. It makes us better candidates for the school board to hear all the voices in our community. I'm gonna put students first always. I know that sounds silly, and but I, I work for an organization that I did not buy into putting customers first for the first five years of working for them. And working with our leaders and our, and our organization, I found out why we put our, our customers over our employees. And it's been proven time over time again, even in standard management practices. When you put your customers first, everything else aligns directly. If you make it the mission to put students first, we will be able to provide the tools and the resources to our amazing educators to ensure that we suit, that we put our students first and give them the tools and resources that they need. I wanna be able to have a board that makes sure that we support our superintendent, but also our job is to provide policy, finance and direction for the superintendent to be held accountable for those actions. That is the role of a school board member. And that's what I want to bring to CPS. I wanna be able to bring my leadership and management skills to help make CPS the best school district in the state. If elected to the board, some of my priorities will be building back relationships with our community partners. When I talk about community partners, that is not only our community members, but that is organizations like the Mule Skinners and all the organizations that we have in Columbia, that's private and public businesses, that is our local government, our state government, and our federal government. When people hear the words Columbia Public School, they should think certain things. Outstanding Education Center, Role Model Education Center, State-of-the-art Training Centers, High Quality Amazing Educators. That's what I want people to hear in 10 years when we hear the words Columbia Public Schools. If I could get it done in five, I would still succeed for that. But I think it's gonna take us a few years to get there. I wanna repair our communication. We have gotten into a world where we feel like email is the only communication. And if I could take email away, I would do it in a heartbeat. I love face-to-face -face communications and I love talking to people on the telephone. So if anybody ever wants to call me, I would love to hear any of your thoughts and opinions about how we can make Columbia Public Schools better. 
I am about providing results and delivering on my promises. You could ask anybody that I've worked for, when I take something and I'm a very passionate about it, I will make it the best that I can. And then when I make it the best I can, I'm gonna tear it back down and I'm gonna build it back better. So I am not okay with status quo. I wanna be able to say, I'm a board member for the Columbia Public Schools and I wanna help make your education center just as, as excellent as ours. Again, I wanna thank each and every one of you today. You guys had great questions and I really look forward to some partnerships that we could build in the future. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I guess I turn it back over to David Mallory. I appreciate it, Leslie. Leslie, thank you again for serving as moderator. Great job as usual. And I want to appreciate, extend our appreciation to both of our panelists, uh, Andrea and Adam. Appreciate you all being here, taking time out of your day to be here with us.